Hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. I think uh, scholars already joined us from different parts of the world. Uh, I, Dr. Mohsin Hassan Han, would like to formally welcome you all to the International Virtual Interactive Session with uh, Professor Dr. Mark Dewis. We are really honored to have uh, one of the pioneer and leading scholar in the field of media and communication studies from uh, world's best media school, University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. The sole purpose of this session is to bring scholars from various parts of the world together and provide them an intellectual platform for learning and advancement, especially in research. Let me give you a quick uh, introduction of our speaker. Mark Dews is a professor of media studies at the University of Amsterdam, Faculty of Humanities with honorary appointments at the Faculty of Journalism at Lomonosov Moscow State University, Russia, the School of Communication of the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, and the Department of Communication and Media Studies of Northumbria University, UK. Before that, he worked as journalist and academic in the United States, Germany, and South Africa. He is also the best bass player and the singer of Skin Floor. Publications of his work include over the 100 papers in academic journals and 11 uh, books, including Life in Media, the MIT uh, the MIT Press forthcoming 2023, McCoyle's famous book, I mean, Media and Mass Communication Theory, seventh edition published by Sage in May 2020, co-authored with Dennis McCoyle, Beyond Journalism, co-authored with Tamara Vestage, pub uh, published February 2020 by uh, Polite Press, and Making Media, co-edited with Mirjam Pranger, published uh, in January 2019 by Amsterdam University. Press. Once again, we are really uh, honored uh, to have uh, one of the uh, most cited uh, and renowned professor uh, in the field of media and communication studies, Professor Dr. Mark Dewis from University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Over to you, Prof. Thank you so much, uh, Musin. Th thank you for your kind words and introduction. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining in. Uh, uh, very good to to see uh, everybody. Um, I, I know maybe many of us are a bit tired of virtual conferences and suffer from Zoom fatigue. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I do think there's a wonderful aspect, if you can use that word, of the pandemic that we've all like experienced and continue to experience over these last couple of years is that these kind of connections are normal, are much more normal now that we zoom into each other's worlds and lives and, and share our thoughts, share work in progress, uh, um, and, and uh, especially between parts of the world where it's not that simple to just fly into and visit uh, for a talk of half an hour or 45 minutes and, 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 so, um, uh, but parts of the world that really desperately need to connect much more in our field. Um, so, so I'm really uh, deeply appreciative uh, of this chance and opportunity to to, to chat with you today. Um, what I have planned uh, for us is a presentation. Um, it should be about uh, uh, thirty to forty minutes. Um, um, Although whenever a professor says, put a time limit on what he or she is saying, you have to be careful. Um, where I would like to talk a little bit about what I feel is a really interesting conundrum that we find ourselves in as a field. Because I'm assuming for a moment that most of the people who are logging in, who are participating in the session, whether live or perhaps later on uh, in the recording, in the debate online, that we study... Uh, or teach and do research in a field that has many different names, but comp is comprised of media studies, communication science, and versions thereof, digital media, new media, uh, mediated communication, mass communication. There's different names for it in different parts of the world, according to different disciplinary traditions. But generally speaking, we're all here because we care about media, the media, and mediated communication. And um, 
and which is great. At the same time, we don't agree what it exactly is that we're studying and teaching. Uh, there's no agreed upon definition of either media or communication for that matter. Um, there's, uh, I mean, almost at the department level at universities and other institutes of higher learning around the world, there are still intense debates about what exactly our field is. I mean, uh, uh, Moshina, as you said, I, 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 I have the privilege of working and, and teaching at the Department of Media Studies at the University of Amsterdam. And, uh, but within my own department, we have nine different programs that do not necessarily agree with each other what it is that they're doing let alone the fact that across the street uh, from our city, in, in our city of Amsterdam, we have a Department of Communication Science, uh, also known as the Amsterdam School of Communication Research, who are just as big as we are, study the same things, but in a radically different way, and we hardly talk to each other. So it's, it's, it's complicated. And, and um, well, that in and of itself, could even be seen as a strength of our field, the fact that we do not have a consensual body of theories and methods, that we don't have a centrally organized paradigm, that we are open to the world uh, in, 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 in true ontological fashion. Um, the, a, a problem perhaps here is that we, at the moment, operate, teach, and work in a world that is suffused with worries and concerns about media. Uh, I mean, we are living through a parallel pandemic and infodemic. We are struggling under the constraints of surveillance capitalism and threats to cybersecurity. We um, are dealing uh, uh, with the situation of profound and impactful hybrid warfare, like it's going on right now in Ukraine, uh, where the war as is fought by guns and soldiers is only an afterthought to a long running war in media. Uh, and where media are clearly a powerful uh, tool, a weapon of war, uh, both for those who defend themselves as the one who attack. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, we are around the world suffering from a host of social issues and problems in part related to problematic media use so and today elon musk bought twitter <laughs> that, that's also uh, a reason why our field is really important to make sense of that purchase but i don't know what your experience is but my experience and as far as i can tell most of our experience is that nobody asks us what to make of all of this Media scholars tend not to be invited at the table of making sense about media. I mean, we have psychologists and 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 economists and and people from political sciences, biologists, uh, neuroscientists, uh, um, you know, uh, from all kinds of disciplines. And it's wonderful and it's lovely that they get to say something about media. But what about the media scholarship that is out there? Um, so that's kind of the context, the setting within which I want to present uh, an argument to you today. And the argument is roughly an attempt to articulate what it is that we do as media scholars, again, under different names, different disciplinary uh, concepts, media studies, digital media, communications, science, mass communication theory, whatever you want to call it. What is it that we do with media that makes us still distinct from any other field that studies media, whether it's an anthropologist or an economist or a psychologist or any of the other uh, wonderful colleagues in, in all the other disciplines that also study media these days? What is the difference between them and us? Secondly, where does this difference come from? Like, how does this difference, how, do, how has this difference got articulated in our field? Because I feel that that history is important to appreciate the situation we're in now. And then finally, how can we effectively study media and mass communication in the 
contemporary context where, as many scholars in our field have argued over the last couple of decades, everything is mediated. In other words, how do you study something that you are also part of and that you are also doing? Right. This is the double articulation of, of our field, that we study something that we're, while we're studying, also making. Uh, and how do you study media when you live in media? Um, um, and that 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 is a profound uh, a challenge, and and I would argue also an opportunity. And I think our own field has given us some really interesting answers, answers that we don't see in any other field. And so, in a way, what I'm going to do, what I'm hope to do, is in a nutshell, give us two things that are particular to what we do that distinguish ourselves from what other colleagues are doing, and that we can use to perhaps reserve a seat at that table, at that table of, of public discourse about where we're going, you know, as a species, as a planet. Uh, what do we want from this world that we're all inhabiting and that we're all experiencing and that we're also mediating? Um, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. I'm hoping you see uh, a slide at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Great, fabulous technology to the rescue. Um, right, um, and and I'll I'll present uh, my argument using some images as as support, and 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 then uh, please feel free to leave comments in the chats or of course afterwards in the Q and A. Uh, and and I really look forward to a discussion about all of this. So like uh, um, 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 like I said uh, earlier. Um, the key idea behind this, uh, the uh, about my presentation today, is the story of media studies and mass communication science as a field. Um, just real quick, uh, the agenda for today: Why should we care? Um, how can we define our field, even though we don't really have one? <laughs> um, I would argue that my contribution to this whole debate has been the Media Life or Life and Media Project. Uh, um, so I'll briefly um, signal that. Uh, then how do we actually study media in an environment where everything is mediated? And if I got time, which I probably won't, I'd like to uh, address how we can help uh, the, the current debates that uh, exist in the world about, for example, the infodemic around, uh, next to the pandemic, about surveillance capitalism, cybersecurity, and so on and so forth. My own credentials in this area are twofold. Uh, the reason why I can claim uh, a voice uh, in this area, um, I think partly because of the work that I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years or so on what I've called in a book in 2012, Media Life, the notion that we don't live with, but in media. There's also a Dutch book of this, and there's a new book forthcoming, uh, going to be published next year by the MIT Press, which is also intended as an introduction to media studies. Secondly, uh, I've been involved with editing and co-authoring uh, the late Dennis McQuail's handbook of media mass communication theory, um, which has given me a sort of a unique perspective of the field as a whole, at least in terms of the narrative that Dennis has consistently tried since the 1960s to write about our field. I mean, uh, if you'll forgive me, I, I would make the argument that what sets his book apart from the other incredibly rich and varied handbooks and textbooks of our field is that rather than listing famous scholars and theories and methods, Dennis has always consistently tried to write the story of our discipline, uh, which to some extent explains why his books are somewhat difficult to read. Uh, um, they're not a neat catalog uh, of issues and names and, 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 and so on, but uh, is a really important uh, archive, an archival effort of where do our ideas come from and why this is important. So again, why we should care about our field and what we do is pretty clear from the contemporary context of an infodemic that the World Health Organization announced uh, right at the start of announcing a pandemic uh, related to the COVID-19 virus. Uh, we are 
uh, experiencing, witnessing, participating in an era of hybrid warfare, uh, most notably at the moment, uh, what is happening in Ukraine, but also in other parts of the world, in Syria, in Yemen, for example, um, where media are a tool of war, a tool of attack as well as defense, a tool of individuals trying to make sense of their lives in the context of war, of telling their story, uh, and, 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 and of a war that populates our personal social media news feeds, whether we like it or not. Um, um, and I think that really raises the issue the, of the role of media in, in, in all of this. Uh, um, we have the, the sphere of surveillance capitalism that demands our attention and debate all over the world. And there is this notion of problematic media use that is consistently evoked in public in public discourse, right? Uh, media addiction, smartphone addiction, porn addiction, video game addiction, all these kind of words, uh, pathologies are bandied about uh, to signal uh, um, uh, various instances of problematic media use. We can have a debate about the extent of validity of all these claims, but what is clear and what they all have in common is the recognition of how profound, pervasive, and ubiquitous media have become in people's lives anywhere on the planet. And I think that is a key argument for why we should study media from the perspective of media stuff. As we look at how the, the field has come about and how we can define it, what makes the field a field, again, a key insight must be, and Sylvia Weisbord, we Ethan's books uh, about this are, I think, a prime reference here, is that we are a field that really isn't one. And that in itself defines us. Um, um, the fact that we can't agree on what we study, that um, simply saying that you, that you do media studies means something very different in the United States than it means in Pakistan, or, uh, and it means something different again in New Zealand. So, so that is interesting in and of itself. There is a, a plethora of methods, both quantitative and qualitative, often mixed. There is uh, an endless array of concepts neatly borrowed from all kinds of other disciplines. It's, it's a lovely uh, mess, uh, if you will, and perhaps that is what our field is. However, I would say that there are a couple of things that are profoundly key to what it is that we do. And I think at the heart of everything, while acknowledging, while acknowledging that the way we care about media and communication in whether you would call it the Western Hemisphere or the Global North, compared to you know different, for example, Asian traditions in in studying and 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 historicizing media and communication, whether you know from a Confucian perspective in in, in China or the, uh, in the Islamic, the history of rich history history of Islamic thinking about the role of media and communication in societies. These are very different schools of thought. I don't want to essentialize these schools to particular parts of the world, but I want to acknowledge that thinking, caring about expressing concerns about what media and communication or mediated communication means in a society very greatly around the world. Uh, um, for example, there is a preoccupation with reality, facts, and truth in much Western scholarship on media and communication, which is much less prominent in, in um, Asian and African schools of thinking, where key concerns are often have much more to do with preserving traditions, uh, with establishing community and harmony, um, or with respect for authority, for example. So uh, uh, truth and reality are much less of a benchmark there than it is community and harmony. Uh, but at the same time, there are, of course, incredible differences. Uh, um, and the, all these schools of thought have always uh, influenced each other. And I would argue need to do that more now than ever before because we live in a globally networked media slash digital environment. But what does connect all these different schools of thought, these different traditions, these diff different histories of thinking about and making sense of media communication, is the fact that we generally see media or media communication as a problem to be solved. 
Um, even when we're excited about media, whether the media is a, a, a specific channel or technology, like film or digital, or whether media is a text, like a motion picture or a game or a piece of news, or whether media is a profession or an industry, like journalism or advertising, for example. Every time when we talk about media, when we study media, we can we can be positive or excited about it or, 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 or dystopian or critical about it. But the bottom line is we somehow assume that media in and of itself make a difference in the way the world works and the way people interact in the way people make sense of the world, how they live their lives. Media as a problem to be solved. And that, I think, is, is, is an interesting uh, um, 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 commonality in all these schools of thought. Why? Because one wonders why we think this is a problem. And my argument would be is that this notion of media as being problematic, intrinsically problematic, comes from this assumption that without media, this problem wouldn't exist. So without media, if people would communicate without the interference of media, that would be the, a better possibility of true, perfect communication or union between people. Um, this is an in insight I get from the work of John Durham Peters, specifically his 99 book, uh, uh, Speaking Into the Air, uh, A History of the Idea of Communication. And, and and, and, and I think John points to a really profound issue, a profound assumption that undergirds all our scholarship. The expectation that somehow, some way, at some point, we can return to a situation where we understand each other perfectly. And of course, this will never happen. This is impossible. Uh, and so we study a problem that cannot be solved. And I think that's one of the first for me, really fascinating insights about our field. It doesn't, you know, uh, uh, invalidate any of our research. It just means that uh, it makes me humble in the kind of claims that I can make about what my field does and doesn't do and how my field can help and cannot help uh, with the situation in the world. Um, this history of our field as studying media as a problem to be solved has different historical phases. I'm not quite sure if that's the right term because that would suggest that, you know, there's a neat progress throughout history. Uh, I think there's different ways of approaching this problem. And the dominant or the first way that this problem was approached, the problem of media to be solved, was to see media as an outside manipulator, an agitator, a corrupter. Uh, I mean, uh, an example that you find in most Western handbooks of media is the example of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds radio play in the 1930s that was supposedly stirring terror all across the United States when it came on the radio. That never happened. That terror and that impact, hardly anybody listened to the show, but the newspapers the next day reported on it as if it happened. Um, that's a, a, The reason for that is a different uh, presentation altogether. But what is interesting for me and the reason why I'm, I'm telling you this story is that it benchmarked a period, a, a, a way of thinking about media that attributes media in incredible power. Power to manipulate, to corrupt the minds of the people that would use them, would listen to them, that would watch them, that would listen, that that would uh, see them, and and that idea has never gone away. We shouldn't make the mistake to attribute this to the naivete of the 1930s uh, in the United States. No, no, no. Today's claims about. Um, What's going to happen to Twitter and what is Twitter going to do to us because Elon Musk is now its owner, have in them a concern about all-powerful media. Now that Musk owns Twitter, society will become polarized and right and left-wing people will start fighting each other in the streets. Like it's a, We're back in the 1930s listening to Orson Welles. A second tradition of scholarship in our field that considers media as a problem 
you could argue arose in the 1970s, both in the social sciences with Wilbur Schrumpf's uh, interactive model of communication, as well as in the humanities with Stuart Hall's famous encoding decoding model, model and, the, and the conceptualization of a circuit of culture. What both these models appeared within a year of each other in the scholarly literature. Of course, they never referred to each other, but they're pretty much the same model using different concepts. And if you want to remember anything about these models is all the, all the lines and the arrows in these models. What they signify is an attempt by a field that recognizes that, wait a minute, media are not all powerful, but clearly they have powerful effects. It's just that these effects are not straightforward. They're complicated. And they work on different levels in different ways that are hard to disentangle. And that sort of more nuanced version of the same old idea, namely that media are a problem to be solved, is can you can you can consider as a sort of a second way, a second wave, a second phase of sense making in our field. The third wave is um, uh, is, is an acknowledgement that the world of media is even more complicated than we thought it was. It's not just a bunch of media companies. It's just not a bunch of media technologies or channels. It is all of that, including all kinds of other sectors in society, most notably the telecommunications and technology sectors. So we, what we see in this kind of literature is an acknowledgement that our media context, our mediated context is a is an environment, an, an, a universe, a media and entertainment and technology universe within which we as a global species move about. And where there are massive companies uh, um, um, that, that in terms of market value dwarf almost all other companies on the planet with the exception of gas, electricity and oil companies. And, and, and where we, I mean, are, are subsequently uh, lost as consumers uh, and need to be protected against these media. So we see, again, this notion of powerful media returning in an acknowledgement that we're now part of a media universe. So uh, uh, interesting studies to be done in this area on the political economy of, for example, the Internet. Uh, uh, the work, as I mentioned before, on surveillance capitalism comes to mind here. Um, um, uh, people's rights, children's rights in the context of an online environment in which they grow up, whether they like it or not. And the final or if, if fourth uh, phase uh, in, in that defines the different approaches in media studies and mass communication research, I would coin as a consistent and recurring emphasis on finding sources of power and agency in all of this. So again, an acknowledgement that left unchecked, our media or our digital environment is all comprehensive, all powerful, and that our job as media scholars is to identify, find sources of what Manuel Castells has called communication power, or let's just say individual agency. Um, how can we keep standing? How can we keep swimming in an ocean of media? Right. So looking for sources of power and agency in the metaverse. <laughs> uh, this, this concept that um, has been co-opted by Mark Zuckerberg uh, is, of course, an, an iteration of a much older idea from uh, science fiction literature. Um, but even that is an, an, an a version of, a, of, an, of an idea that has been circling around the media and technology industries for many, many, many decades, which is this notion that ideally our media environment should not require any deliberate expertise or knowledge or choice on the part of the consumer. Right? The notion of ubiquitous and intuitive computing, the notion that our media would serve us best if we don't have to think about them anymore. This is a very old idea, first formulated in the nine, late 1970s, that constantly finds new iterations and new products and services 
Today, it's the metaverse. But also, again, think about what Elon Musk has said about his purchase of Twitter. His intent to build a super app, uh, an app X, one app to rule them all, to refer Lord of the Rings here for a second. The notion that at some point, the only thing we will ever need to do anything in life is just log into one app. And this is a notion that has been consistently recurring in the discourse uh, um, of the media, entertainment and technology industry, again, for uh, well over 50 years now. And, um, um, and, and we're just finding ourselves in the latest iteration thereof. And you see that our field tends to respond by one of these four approaches, considering this as all powerful and scary and dangerous, uh, and people need to be protected, considering it as more complicated, but still trying to find ways in which media effects happen to people. Um, thirdly, beginning to appreciate the political economy of this universe and trying to unpack all the different ways media effects work. And finally, accepting that this is a ubiquitous and pervasive environment, and then within that environment, start looking for sources of communication power and agency. Now, what all of this has brought us as a field, I would argue, is and a way of thinking and writing and speaking and presenting about media and mass communication that is fairly distinct from any other discipline. And the distinction um, lies, I think, in how we fundamentally feel, and I deliberately use the word feel, about media. Because I think that I would argue, I would postulate that all other academic disciplines that also study media tend to feel about media as a meteor, a comet that comes at us, that falls from the sky and does things to us. So when a media uh, psychologist study media, um, he or she or they consider a person or people in general as a more or less coherent whole, and media as an external agent affecting those people. And the same can be said about an economist or a political scientist or anybody else who studies media. But in media studies, in mass communication science, I think we've evolved through these various phases that I've just documented into not seeing media as something outside of us, but as media as something that we use to create the world that we live in which is a fundamentally different way of thinking about media. Even if we consider media as powerful and or problematic, we still acknowledge that we are not who we are without media. So the media is not a comet that falls from the sky. Media is the sky. Or as some people would say today, um, uh, media are the digital air we breathe. So in a nutshell, I would offer as a story of our field, the notion that media is not something that happens to us. Media, uh, we look at how people make worlds happen in and through media. And that, that is the most fundamental assumption of our field uh, um, um, that, that drives our arguments and our literature. That is also what we have to add to the global discussion, that, that when people call us journalists, uh, uh, you know, in, in public debates and in discussions at a neighborhood community cafe when we have a cup of tea with friends and they ask us about media and they worry about media, that what we can tell them is, is perhaps we should not just worry about what media are doing to us, but stop projecting our anxieties and fears onto our media and accept our own role in making a world through these devices and texts that you're so worried about. Which reminds people of, of A, their own responsibility, B, their shared agency, and three, the possibility of having a collective voice of changing this world into something that perhaps may be better than it was before, rather than our discussion only being about how we're going to prevent this comet from hitting the planet. 
Um, in my own work, I've tried to articulate a perspective on our field, like I said at the beginning, from the position that we don't live with media, but uh, uh, we live in media, that there is no meaningful outside to media. Um, I must admit that about 12 years ago, when I started with that project, this was a intellectual exercise, an hypothesis. And I would argue that today, this isn't a hypothesis anymore. Uh, and I'm not saying that to say, oh, I was right. No, I got my ideas from so many other people, a lot of authors writing already for many, many decades before. So I think in a way we've always lived in media. It's just that today it has become so abundantly clear that we do. But what, what does that exactly mean? And I think for me, exploring what that means gives me a chance to articulate the most profound problem of our field, which is how do you study media when you live in media? So what does living in media mean? Very briefly, because I realize uh, we don't have all the time in the world and you're very patient in sticking uh, uh, with us uh, today. I really appreciate that. Um, I think it means on a fundamental level, three things, three, I think, assumptions that we can make about anything we study when we study media. And the first assumption is that our media disappear from us. The second is that media are what we do. In other words, everything that we do one way or another involves media. And thirdly, that our primary relationship with media is affective or emotional. In other words, we love media, love not as an emotion, but as a category of strong feelings that people have about our media. And just to illustrate what I mean with these three things, um, uh, like I did on the cover of my original book on this matter, where you saw fish swimming, had a notion that media are to us like water is to fish, uh, both invisible and inevitable. Uh, media disappear quite literally in a sense that their existence as discrete technologies disappears and they return to us as, as, as sort of generic platforms, right? The, the phone that used to be this device with which you can only do one thing at one particular location now has become this ubiquitous uh, app that lives on a variety of platforms. Um, our bodies being used as media, as remote controls and joysticks when we move to environments that are enabled by voice activation or motion sensing. Um, but the media also disappear in the sense that people cannot really meaningfully express how much time they've spent with media. They, they never could. And an interesting phenomenon in media use studies today is that up until the 1990s, when you would ask people about how much time they spent, for example, watching TV, they would underrepresent the hours they spent. And if you ask people today, they tend to overrepresent the hours they spent. But in both cases, they're incorrect. Uh, in that sense, media disappear too. Media become increasingly intuitive to use. We are moving towards an immediate environment filled with what the industry calls natural user interfaces. The emphasis on the world word natural, right? Interfaces that we don't really see as interfaces because we have become the interface. Our fingers when we swipe, our voice when we talk. Uh, media are what we do in a sense that from the moment we're born, uh, media in one way or another play a role, sometimes directly because we have access to media. There's a nanny cam in, in the bedroom and stuff like that. But even for those people who do not have access to certain technologies and media, media play a role because the way the rest of the world interacts with them is primarily informed through media. So both in terms of direct and indirect access, media, uh, play a part in what we do and how we grow up, how we how we form relationships, friendships, uh, uh, romantic relationships, how we find work, how we study, how we learn, how we play. All of that involves media, and media, of course, are never neutral 
in these relations. Um, we see this throughout the life of children we see this in the way we are supposedly in control of our information environment i don't know about you but i don't think anybody really feels that much in control we see it in the way people co-opt media for their struggles to protest things in the world to try to change the world whether it was for example during the arab spring uh, or the ongoing protests against um, uh, the election of president bolsonaro in brazil the il and now campaign uh, comes to mind um, uh, the, the, the way refugees around the world um, can leave everything behind except our media, their media becoming this lifeline to navigate to often hostile territories. Um, and finally, we love media. Um, I've been documenting this love for the last 12 years or so through a website called Why I Heart My Media, where I invite my students to anonymously explain their feelings for media and and it always strikes me every year i ask my students to do this how articulate they are about all their feelings regarding media and the bottom line is of all these feelings is that they're very very powerful very strong and i'm just consistently reminded how significant and important it is to keep this in mind is that people's primary relation with media is deeply effective and therefore also emotional and i deliberately use the word love because it is arguably one of the strongest emotions or emotional categories we can um, uh, talk about uh, as um, um, uh, as human beings um if you want to know more about this entire approach uh next year this my new book on this is coming out on life and media where i'm going to use this perspective to talk about media studies as a field so i'm just going to leave it there um i want to end today with three final thoughts um and they all have to do with how we can study media and meaningfully say things about them in an environment where we live in them where we are like Truman in a Truman show and unlike Truman we know that we live in a completely mediated environment and unlike Truman we decide not to escape or we realize that we can't escape so how can we effectively use interpret understand critique media in an environment where we live in media and this, I think, is one of the most interesting and profound challenges in our field, because all too often in publications on mass communication and media studies, I see assumptions about the way people think about, use, and interpret media that somehow suggest that people can have some distance to their media, that, that, that media operate on the outside of people's lives. Uh, whereas. I think fundamentally what our field has taught us is that people make their lives, make their worlds in and through their media, directly and or indirectly. So how do we step away from media if, if we are in media at the same time? And uh, I think we have three really great tools for that, that our field has developed over time. And the first tool is the glitch. Uh, it's a term from uh, 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 both from computer programming. A glitch is, of course, when a computer program um, has an error, uh, like uh, when a, a piece of software has a bug. Um, um, or uh, in feminist uh, scholarship, glitches are used to highlight the failure of concepts to adequately and uh, neatly categorize and explain things, such as gender, for example. But for us in media studies, the glitch is mainly a way of deliberately embracing and exploring every time something goes wrong, when a media fails, when a story doesn't make sense, when a piece of technology breaks down, um, um it's 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 a wonderful way to deliberately look for exploit uh the many errors in our media environment 
rather than describing how things usually work. Um, 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 we could focus on all those moments when media break down. A second approach, a second concept that helps us study media while living in media is uh, the notion of the uncanny. Uh, I deliberately use the image of the recent movie Ex Machina here about uh, a sentient uh, robot, uh, a cyborg, or whatever you want to call it, uh, 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 a young woman who is made up uh, by an artificial intelligence that in itself is derived from people's social media use, and who becomes self-aware and decides to escape into the real world. Um, and what our experience with her in this movie is like our experience with all media, which is a, a profound experience of uncanniness. When we use media, when people use media, inevitably they experience things that are weird, strangely unfamiliar, even sometimes uncomfortable. It is inevitable of uh, when we consider our lives in media that we run up against weirdness, strangeness. For example, um, if two people attend the same public events and later on uh, see um, uh, that, that different media have different descriptions of these events, and one person says 100 people attended, the other person says 10,000 people attended, one person says everybody was angry, the other person says everybody was celebrating. I mean, that is one way in which uncanniness presents itself, but there are countless ways of uncanniness, of weirdness, of uncomfortableness, and I don't even know if that's a word. But I think that's um, to acknowledge that using media inevitably introduces something uncanny into your life. And I think that harks back to my comment all the way at the start of today's presentation, this notion that fundamentally we see media as a problem to be solved. And I made the arguments, we cannot solve this problem. And maybe we should actually consider the problem, the solution. Namely, the problem is uncanniness, unfamiliarity. The thing, the, the sense that things are not exactly right. I am not completely seen or understood, which is a fundamental human feeling that gets amplified and accelerates when we move in, when we use media. And that is not the problem. That is the source of knowing and of research and of understanding, both of yourself, of media, and our role in the world. And thirdly, and I, I don't have an image for this, I want to uh, uh, um, suggest a third concept. So the first was the glitch, the second, the uncanny. The third one is a concept that I get from Søren Kierkegaard, uh, who talks about the dizziness of freedom. And I'm going to ruthlessly <laughs> co-opt this statement, the dizziness of freedom, to suggest that one thing that we can do with the digital environment at our disposal is to radically imagine alternate or different futures. Um, as media scholars, we are often present is a distinct issue in media studies, the technology of the day, the new thing, right? Elon Musk buying Twitter. So we have to make sense of the here and now, the shiny new toy that everybody's talking about, the amazing movie director who's, who's Jordan Peele, who's changing the horror movie genre as we speak. And yes, of course, we should do that. But can we use also all this profound media in an environment to imagine alternate futures what can we only imagine the metaverse in terms of mark zuckerberg or is there a different way of thinking about the metaverse i would say yes and actually i would make the argument we already live in the metaverse and i'll be happy to ex explain or explore that argument with you later today the point is through embracing and exploring the many failures and errors of media by not considering media as a problem to be solved, but as a source of unfamiliarity and uncanniness that leads to deeper understanding of our role in the world, and to use these media that we have to radically imagine alternate and different futures and then go about in creating them, we can have a real voice at the table. We have something to say 
to people beyond talking about media as a scary comet that will fall onto Earth. That's my presentation uh, um, for today. Um, I hope some of this made sense. I know these are a lot of abstract uh, ideas. Uh, I, I've been shameless in using this very kind invitation, Mosin, to, 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 to talk about work in progress and ideas I have of our field. But please consider this not as a way of this is how it is and how I define things, but this is an invitation to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Truly grateful to you for such a thought provoking and, you know, uh, an amazing, I can say, uh, insights from you side, you know, thank you so much, you know, truly grateful to you. Uh, now I would like to uh, open the forum for the participants. Uh, and I'm also grateful to the participants that have joined us worldwide, you know, like including, I can see some deans, some directors, heads of the departments, faculty members, students, uh, PhD and master students as well. So please, Dr. Atif, go ahead. You can even write in chat box or you can simply unmute yourself and directly ask the question. Thank you, Mohsin, uh, for this wonderful session. And thank you, Dr. Mark, for enlightening us on such a different topic. Uh, I think what we have elaborated us earlier that in the start, you told us that we need to be critical about media, how media is working. And secondly, your emphasis was on that we should be focusing uh, on media as as a wonderful thing in our lives, not as a problem. So while we'll be looking in this particular aspect, as you have pointed out in your lecture in the book, which is the new book which is coming. So what the theoretical framework you will suggest us to study uh, these concepts which you introduce. Obviously, these are the wonderful concepts, but we as a researcher and students also like study these concepts, what theoretical framework would ultimately guide us to study all this? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's a, th thank you for, for, for attending, for participating, and thank you for your question. Um, I, I, I do want to acknowledge that, that I'm not just, I'm, I mean, obviously, there are profound problems associated with media. Like, I'm not saying media are just fine. And I'm, I just don't think that in and of themselves, they are the problem that we need to solve. Um, uh, as, as I think we all, all appreciate, is that the same texts or technologies that can cause, you know, all kinds of problems, unrest uh, and upheaval, also contributes to the solutions thereof. I mean, um, uh, I just want to reference uh, the late uh, Dennis McQuill here, who a couple of years ago, a couple, just before his passing, wrote this wonderful essay about the role of media in war, where he made the observation based on reviewing the available evidence around the world that, yes, media can contribute to war, uh, fuel the fires of resentment and, and, and anger and conflict in society. But at the same time, media can contribute to making wars end simply by, for example, showing what war does to people. And um, so that is a strong and powerful example of where media is in and of itself not the problem, but through me media, we can both see what the problem is as well as its solution, or at least potential solution. So, um, and you asked me, so what, what kind of theoretical framework should we then use? And, you know, I, I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't give you three <laughs> conflicting answers. <laughs> but but, but I, I consider this as a suggestion or as, a, as, a, as an example of, of how, I, how I would go about in, in, in my work. Um, I, I tend to, to, to and, and again, this is taken from work that has already been done by so many other colleagues in our field. One of the first ways of tackling this theoretically, when we want to study the role of media and mediated communication in any kind of context, whether it's war or social unrest or, you know, the pandemic and infodemic or any surveillance or any other major issue, I think it's really important, and this is something that our field has, has, has done very well, but it's counterintuitive, which is to take a theoretical perspective of decentering media, um, to look beyond their existence as technologies and texts, 
and to keep on and asking the question, what are people actually doing? Um, uh, so, so um, and, and this is such a simple technique, uh, but it's also a powerful theoretical perspective because it, pre it prevents us from sticking too close to the shiny new toy, like I said earlier, to the technology of the day, to what is happening right now. But to acknowledge, for, for example, that what people today do on TikTok and Snapchat and, 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 and Twitch and Instagram isn't that different from what happened in the past. Uh, but there are differences that are very distinct about these platforms, obviously. But we need both. And in order to get that, we have to decenter the media. We have to look at what people are already doing and where does this behavior come from? So that is one approach to your question. I think secondly, I wanna again go back to my mentor and my former colleague, Dennis McQuill, who always was very adamant that a fundamental and explicit theoretical perspective for media and communication scholars should be ethics. Uh, or you could also say call this a normative approach. Like, like we should, we should, that sounds too, too aggressive. I, what I say is that I think it would help if we make explicit why we care about what we do, what we study, why this is important, why, why it matters. Uh, um, 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 why? Because our field is a hopeful one. Right? We consistently ask questions about the world, research questions that assume that if these questions are answered correctly, things could be made better. Wonderful, but make that explicit. What is your normative expectation from this thing that you study? This, uh, so, so to make our ethics and our normative expectations explicit, to take responsibility for them, to have a voice, Right? One of the reasons why our field doesn't seem to have much of a public voice is because we don't occupy that space. And, 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 and I, again, I'm echoing Silvio Weisbord's call for public scholarship, right? But we can only be public scholars, not if we tweet all the time or, we, or if we blog about our, our, our work, but if we know what we stand for. So that's the second, uh, so the first one is to these center media in, in our research, to always ask the question what people are doing. A second theoretical perspective would be to make our ethical perceptions or normative expectations explicit, to take responsibility for what we study. Um, and I think thirdly, and this is why <laughs> my answer to your question is also a little bit um, um, paradoxical perhaps, um, I want to um, um, uh, counter my first uh, <laughs> suggestion, which is to make our theories specific to our media. Because as you probably have noticed that, that, that my comments today are deeply influenced by what you could call a phenomenological perspective on media. Like rather than describing different media and different technologies and different texts, I'm focusing more on how media feel to people. Uh, what the experience of mediation does to people. And there's a, there's a phenomenological bent to this. Uh, um, while I think that is really important, at the same time, I'm also prof profoundly aware that different media do different things in different circumstances. And for this, we need an appreciation of their materiality. Um, so in other words, we need media studies as much as we need media theory. We need a theoretical conceptualization that looks at media in terms of what people are doing, but also takes the media in and of themselves and, ex and, 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 and explore what they do specifically. Especially, and that's why this argument, again, an old argument, harking back to you know, the work of Marshall McLuhan and many others in the 1960s, um, especially today, this combination of a phenomenological and a material perspective on media is so important, given the fact that so much of our media environment or digital environment operates more or less autonomously from us. You can call this 
you know, um, um, our datafied environment or, or artificial intelligence or machine learning or give, give it a name, uh, algorithmic culture. These are all different names for the same thing, same phenomenon, namely that much of our media environment and much of our mediated experience of life happens without the necessary intervention of humans. It's based on machine to machine communication, on data valence, on information exchange between computers that in turn govern what we see, what we hear, what we read, what we listen to. Um, um, it gives us access or denies us access in all kinds of different ways. And for that, we need a deep materialistic perspective on media to really understand and appreciate how that works. So uh, uh, theoretically, decentering media, I think, is a powerful tool that we have, making explicit and taking responsibility of, of our normative and ethical assumptions and expectations about what media do or should do or shouldn't do. And thirdly, uh, um, to uh, uh, radically embrace a materialistic perspective on media, to truly acknowledge media as autonomous agents or actors in our environment. Okay, uh, we can take uh, one or two more questions, if any. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Mosin, for arranging such a wonderful uh, session. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark, for like telling us some of some of your expertise. My name is Shiraz Asnad. I'm currently a journalist in law, and I just joined academia as well as a partial uh, choice uh, like two, three years back. So like I have a question as you were just talking about the research. So we, the practical journalists, normally we, we are not in touch or intact with the, with the research stuff as well. Um, but what I have just witnessed over there on the academia side, that they are not into the practical side of the journalism as well while doing their research. However, they are all their research samples are actually based on the on the journalists and their their well-being and in fact their work ethics. So unless like the study of the attitude and the behavior of the media and the people working within, how you can see a good research can be conducted, or don't you think that the research, like it should be actively the researcher should actually be actively participated in the professional journalism as well as the media before conducting their research. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, uh, um, Shiraz, if I might say, uh, um, um, for this question. Thank you for, for joining us. A fellow journalist, that I'm very happy to, to, to see and hear that. Um, uh, if I understood your question correctly, um, um, how can you do your research while, do you mean, like also uh, that would be to the benefit of working journalists or that would include journalists or that also is reported in journalism very briefly this is more about when the researchers are actually practically doing the research before conducting the research they should be a part of the practical journalism or the media because that would actually give them an open because while working and studying there in states and because i was a part of the rntc in netherlands as well for a couple of courses so i saw the most of my trainers they were a practical journalist in the past and then they moved and like accommodated in the in the in the academia and through those uh, journalists who moved to into the academia, I probably learned more compared to, I'm sorry, compared to those who actually throughout struggling and working in the academia sector and never professionally and practically worked in the media. Oh, no, I mean, uh, I'll be very honest. I, I share your observation to some extent. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, I got, I love our students and our graduate students and, and many of my colleagues who have lived their entire lives within the academia. Uh, but sometimes I, 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 I wonder, like, oh, <laughs> there's a world out there, right? Uh, um, at the same time, I don't want to stereotype uh, uh, anybody. But, but uh, let, let, let me address this from the perspective of opportunity in the sense that, or possibility. Um, one really interesting development in journalism around the world is that more and more journalists today work in journalism coming from academia. So with academic degrees, bachelor degrees, sometimes even master degrees. So you could, I mean, and this is a development. I mean, back in the 60s, 70s, that was almost never the case. Of course, there were hardly any journalism programs in most parts of the world, but, but even if they did, um, most journalists came from all kinds of, I mean, it's an open profession in, in, in not everywhere, but in, in most places around the world it is. And today, I mean, having an academic background, whether in journalism or any other field, is almost an informal gateway to the profession. So you could argue that there is more um, possibility for collaboration and there's a more uh, mutual understanding possible 
we get each other much better. At least th that there's a possibility there. And I see in academe a similar trend the other way around is that the way academe, academic work is being evaluated and evaluated these days and different parts of the world increasingly includes an assessment to what extent academic work scholarship also resonates beyond the walls of academe, right? I mean, in some countries, this is called valorization. I mean, there's different words for it. Some academics think it's awful. Others think it's wonderful. The bottom line is that there's a growing appreciation that research for the sake of research, that's fine. But there also, at the very least, also should be research for the sake of practice. And that academics have a responsibility here. And as you noticed in my previous answer, that one of our responsibilities, as I see it, is to make our normative expectations and our ethics explicit. And I think this is one way of doing it, is to appreciate that what we study has impact, has, has real world implications, and that we should be responsible for that and do something with that. I mean, uh, from the field of anthropology comes this really wonderful concept that I often use with my when I work with my students, with my graduate students, which is the principle of non-extractive science. And non-extractive science refers to the notion of that when you do research that often involves people, that, that you always make sure to not just extract stuff from them, data, right? But that you also give back. And that could be from the moment you start asking questions to the moment you analyze data, to the moment you publish, it could be in every step of the research process where you actively consider how you and your work can contribute meaningfully to the lives of the people that you intend to either impact or include in your research. Uh, and so uh, for me, it's important to, to answer your question by not just saying, oh, if you have a research publication out there, you should also tweet about it or you should make sure that you give an interview to a journalist somewhere but that you can have a real role to play in in a, in a community uh, even if that community is very small um so that would be a, an important part of answering that question another point is again referring to uh, sylvia weisbord who in 2019 in his book uh on communication and manifesto made this passionate plea for public scholarship Right, is to, to, to think of ourselves as scholars, not just in terms of publishing weighty books and academic journal articles, but 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 go out into the world in all the different ways in which we can, partly through media like we do today, but also in all kinds of other ways. Um, and to make that part of your 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 professional identity as a scholar. And I think that's a very powerful appeal um, that we should take note of. And and um I think finally, what for me really resonates in your question is this notion that, um, I mean, think back what I said all the way at the beginning. I, I made mention of the fact that the unique aspect, as uh, Klaus Brun Jensen has famously articulated, of our field is that it's doubly articulated, right? We study something that at the same time is being used by ourselves and the people we study in the real world. Right. So whatever we study is dynamic. It is it's made it's 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 a practical thing. And 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 so we theorize something that is at the same time moving and meaning different things to different people in the world. And if our theorizing doesn't acknowledge that, then it just doesn't resonate. And 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 I think that is so important for what we do, right? Is to constantly stay mindful of. And that's why in my previous answer to the previous question, I made this argument about decentering media is to keep on coming back, circling back to this fundamental question. So what are people actually doing with this? And then the follow up question would be, and how can I help? In, in my own research on media professionals, as, as, as some of you may or may not know, most of my empirical work has to do with the working lives and the well-being, as you express it as well, about work, uh, media professionals, journalists, but also professionals in games and film and so on. And um, a English colleague, uh, Mark Banks, has beautifully articulated this concept of creative justice in doing research on media professionals. 
Uh, he makes this argument that when you study the way the media industry works, you should make sure that your study helps media professionals do their work, be fairly compensated for their work, and makes the media industry more inclusive, more diverse, uh, um, and, and, and open and accessible for all. That as a guiding principle for doing research. And I think it's such a beautiful and important statement uh, of a very specific aspect of media studies, which is production studies. But it's these, so these are three different ways in which uh, your 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 comment really resonates with me, and I, I thank you for it because it's such an important part of what we do. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, I think uh, we can still take one and last question, if any. I have um, uh, hi John Postil from RMIT in Melbourne. I have a quick question about this idea that we live in media. And um, if we, if you put it that way, isn't there the danger that, and if you say we've always lived in media, that we're not differentiating the different type of media, that those times, uh, in the, no, you know, in the 40s and 50s, when perhaps it was radio that dominated a local, a locality, um, what what do you do with historical ch changes and continuities as well in your approach? Uh, uh, should we, um, for example, when I was thinking when you're saying that people make worlds happen in and, and through media, which is an idea that I, I find very interesting. Isn't it the case also, I mean, do we have to choose between uh, the idea that people make things or do things with media and the other idea that media has an impact on us, do we have to make that choice? Can't we study both uh, how it affects us and how uh, we affect the media in, 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 in return? Thanks. Okay, this is a bit of a fanboy moment because I'm a big fan of John's work. So thank you so much, John, for logging on and participating. Uh, um, and uh, great to see you. Um, um, and and and. Knowing your work, I, I love how you put me on the spot here because, uh, of course, I mean it's 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 a given that saying that people make worlds, including their own, in and through media, doesn't negate the fact that media have effects on them, right, on people. Um, uh, I, I guess I draw the distinction between media as sort of an external agent hurtling at us and disrupting whatever we are or we're doing and media as part and parcel of who we already are to begin with um, is a different way of appreciating media effects um, and and I totally agree with you and with your work that you've published in the past that 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 I mean and I, I think that's such a powerful observation in your own work too, is that, look, media studies have, has always been about media effects, even though some parts of media studies and media scholars don't like to use the word effect. Mm. Uh, but it is, everything is about media effects. I mean, let's just be honest about that. It's just that we approach this from very different ways. And I think the most fundamental way with which our approach differs from those who are disciplinary, located or trained outside of media is uh, it, it makes makes a real difference, and and that difference speaks exactly to your question, I think, because um, the on the one hand, and I think it relates to the question I gave to the first uh, uh, of the answer I gave to the first question. On the one hand, appreciating how historically different media made for different kinds of worlding or different kinds of people people making their own worlds, um, and that those differences matter, like you say, radio in the 1920s or 30s, or television in the 60s and 70s, uh, um, the internet in the 90s, and today social media. I mean, absolutely. Uh, um, and that in and of itself is an important articulation, and it requires sort of a material awareness of different media and what they do and don't do, and why that difference makes a difference. At the same time, it is also important especially historically, how to look at me wagging my finger. That's horrible, I'm sorry. Um, 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 it is also important, especially historically, I, I would argue, is to appreciate that this people making their lives and making sense of their lives and giving themselves shape and identity in and through media has 
um, uh, like you said as well, continuous elements to it. Um, an example that, uh, for example, I, I uh, <laughs> that, that uh, an example, for example, that I use in my book is our relationship with reality and how this relationship has been questioned in different ways in the context of different media throughout human history. And that a lot of the debates today are very different from the debates 100, 200, 300, 4, 500 years ago, when the first authors of the Enlightenment, uh, like Hobbes, for example, or Leibniz, or those kind of people, started wondering, like, is there a real difference between us and machines? And, and, and if there is a difference, and that difference isn't God, which was very dangerous to claim in that time, why and when does that matter? And I, to me, those discussions are, you can copy paste them onto today's discussions about the rights of avatars or the, uh, the rise of robots, right? And, and so, so it's, 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 it's important. And I think I wanna piggyback on your comment about continuity and discontinuity to appreciate both the discontinuity brought about by different media in different parts of the world in different times, enabling people to make different worlds and at the same time, um, to acknowledge how certain discussions, certain debates, certain issues that we con that that we constantly keep revisiting them in and through media, such as the nature of reality and truth, uh, such as um, uh, what do we do in the con? Uh, what is the actual effect of surveillance? I mean that surveillance is also an historical conundrum. It is not particular to um, uh, a book from 1984 or to Facebook today. Um, so it is, I, I think it is both. Now, now, I also appreciate that that is a too easy answer to your question to just say, yeah, all of that is, is true. And we all need to do that at the same time. But uh, I think that problem can be solved by just making this explicit, right? Just to make explicit where you're coming from what your position is and like I said you know make your ethical and normative expectations explicit um, and to acknowledge the historical nature of making sense of this that's why I presented a genealogy of media studies in four phases um, not to say that these phases sort of neatly build on top of each other but to actually acknowledge that all four, four are present in contemporary as well as much older scholarship, sometimes in conjunction, oftentimes without being made explicit. And I think that's where our work can really make a difference is if we are much more explicit about our own position, not just, for example, you know, as white men making claims about what people do or not do with media, but also as scholars that look at things a certain way. I mean, I know that's what you consistently do in, 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 in your publications and in your argument about, you know, not shying away from the word effects in, 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 in humanities inspired scholarship on the media. And, and, and so that's, I think, one of the solutions to this, this problem that you signal. I don't know if that makes any sense, John, but I really appreciate the question. Thanks very much. It's a it was two or three questions sort of thrown in together. Uh, uh, yeah, but thanks. Yeah, it's very helpful. Looking forward to continuing the discussion. Okay, Prof, if you uh, allow me so we can still take one question. <laughs> sure. Okay, one more question, if any. Sir, I have a question. Sir, um, is the electronic media bringing negative effects into the world or is it bringing positive? Because I see more negative news than positive where like uh, we're seeing like terrorism attacks or any negative one political conflicts or anything like that. I don't see any positive news except for a few like entertainment and sports. I don't see many often positive news. So is that like um, I don't see the positive effects. So can you explain to me uh, is there any positive effects in there? Uh, thank you, Alita. I appreciate the question. It's a, a really good question also to, to end our session with because it, 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 it really speaks to the entire project of media studies. And, and part of the reason why media scholars are often not at the table when policy decisions are being made about in society, when the public debates are 
being held about the role of media is because we often refuse to really talk about positives or negatives of media, right? Because we appreciate that people make their lives and 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 people con constitute societies in and through media, and that isn't necessarily positive or negative. And like I said earlier, the role of media in war is both that of accelerant as well as peacemaker. It depends on what you look at and when you look at it. Um, so. Our, our, the fact that we know from our research that media have all kinds of effects, I could, I could argue a lot of them, or maybe even most of them, unintended, uh, 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 contradictory, uh, only particular in, in particular circumstances for particular people. I mean, that kind of nuance, that kind of complexity. Remember the models that I showed with all these arrows. Um, yeah, that doesn't lend itself well for, you know, clear policies or, or, or explicit statements. This is what's going on with the media. We, we don't really have that story other than saying, well, you know, it, 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 it depends. Now, that said, do media, do social media have positive uh, or only negative effects? Let's appreciate for a moment, and that's something I do think... Uh, 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 underscores the need for news literacy in the world is that what we read about media in the news is by definition negative because that's how news works. And, uh, and I, I sometimes wonder whether there shouldn't be a disclaimer on the front page of every newspaper or at the start of every TV show. Like what we're going to talk about today are the exceptions. <laughs> Generally speaking, things are okay. This is just the stuff that's messed up. <laughs> um, um, uh, because people, you know, you can't blame people for thinking the world is going to hell in a handbasket by simply watching the news. Um, and especially news about technology and media is, is almost always horrible, horrible. So a, a young woman somewhere committed suicide because she was bullied on social media. I mean, that's just a heartbreaking piece of news. Somebody should do something about social media. What, of course, is not reported is the fact that for the vast majority of people, most of the time, social media are a lovely place to be, where you see friends, where you learn things, where you can laugh, where you can cry, where you can share parts of your life that are meaningful to you. And then when you log off, you just go on and, you know, buy a soft drink and see your friends. And that's all. Fun. That's what most people experience online most of the time. But some people, some of the time, have horrible, horrible experiences. And, 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 and uh, that needs to be acknowledged and needs to be studied. Like I said, there are plenty of social problem issues that are related to problematic media use and and what is considered a problem is different in different parts of the world of course um but uh, it, it is not a mistake to argue that for most people most of the time media are a source of meaningful and sometimes profound pleasure fun and information um, and the fact that media are pervasive and ubiquitous all across the planet means that for the small group of people for, for whom media can become problematic, we're still talking about millions and millions and millions of people. So this is a serious problem and serious issue that we obviously need to address. Um, so, so the way I approach this 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 question, you know, the positives and negatives of media with my students is always ask them to try to become mindful of their own normative bias towards media. Um, a, a lot of students that come to our Department of Media Studies in Amsterdam do so because they're deeply worried and concerned about media or, and sometimes at the same time, they want to work in those media. <laughs> Which is already a really interesting schizophrenic <laughs> moment, right? Media are a real problem, but I want to make media. It's like, oops. Um, um, uh, and what I try to do with them is first to help them to make their own normative and ethical assumptions and expectations about media explicit. 
and then say, okay, now you've made them explicit. This is kind of what you think and expect of media. Park them. Try to find a spot for them to put them in for a while. And then just look at what people are actually doing. Let's look at what's happening. What does this particular media text do or say? Where are things going with this? Where does it come from? From what tradition of storytelling? From what technological genealogy uh, does this piece of media, this channel uh, uh, herald from? And then once we've documented all of that, then we can come back to our normative and ethical assumptions. And so like, how do the assumptions and expectations relate to what we found? You know, this is the baseline, of course, all of all research. And sometimes our expectations are confirmed and sometimes we have to nuance and make them more complex. That's generally the case, of course. And, and, and um, so that's the second answer. And my third answer, very briefly, I'm sorry, I'm taking up so much time, but it's such an important and good question, is um, I want to tell you a personal story of what happened this morning. Uh, I'm in the, in the United Kingdom at the moment. And as you all of you probably know, I've mentioned it during my talk, today the news broke, or last night, the news broke of Elon Musk, uh, of Tesla and Neuralink and SpaceX, all his companies, he, that he's finally bought Twitter. Uh, he's fired the, the, the existing directors uh, and uh, made all kinds of uh, vague announcements about what he's going to do. And um, I've been fielding calls from journalists all this morning that they have to write stories or make reports on television, explain to people the consequences now that Elon Musk has bought Twitter. I said, Mark, Mark. And then most of their questions weren't about imagining interesting futures for the media and the role that Musk plays in this, but they were about, does this mean that Donald Trump will get back onto Twitter and that society will become polarized, right? And everybody will become extreme in their positions and will have, you know, they didn't say civil war, but that's almost what they um, uh, expected. And, uh, and so what I, I told them was a way of addressing what you say because they were they wanted me to say what the negative consequences are right of 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 musk buying twitter and twitter becoming perhaps more polarized and i i my answer was always the counterintuitive one based on the research that we in our field have done on this namely that the biggest danger to social polarization aren't social media and algorithms it's people and we know that the only way that one of the very few ways that human beings in general get exposed to things they didn't like or expect before is not out of their own free will, but because somebody else made them aware of it. And generally people surround themselves with people like themselves. So we, unless we work very hard, we tend not to really explore new ideas, new people, new religions, new ways of making sense of the world, new movies, new music. Out of our own accord, most people don't really do that because it takes too much time and effort. We've got better things to do. We've got kids to raise. We've got fun to have. We've got beers to drink with friends. I mean, we've got other things to do or tea to drink with friends. Algorithms do a wonderful job in this respect. Thanks to Spotify, people discover new music every day. Thanks to Netflix, people binge watch series they hadn't heard of yesterday. Thanks to uh, the algorithm of Twitter and Facebook, people come across bits and pieces of information, ideas, news, opinions that they didn't hear before. Maybe not radically different from themselves, but different nonetheless. So, so my, my story to them was, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Musk and Twitter. If he gonna dismantle the content moderation algorithms of Twitter and let people decide who to listen to and what opinions to voice, yes, we will have social polarization much more before. Not because Twitter, but because of people. Um, if, he, if you keep algorithms rhythmic control over social media, the chances are most people actually don't get stuck into filter bubbles, don't get stuck in echo chambers. That's what the 
research pans out. It doesn't mean we shouldn't worry about filter bubbles and echo chambers. It just means that um, algorithms are not the problem here. People are. And, um, and, and, and so it's, it's a way to address your question is, is to take attention away from what media do as positive or negative and also appreciate what people do. And, and, and my final overarching thought is look, one way of thinking about the effects that media have in the world is to appreciate that media are an influencing machine. An influencing machine is a concept from psychoanalytic theory that isn't a real thing, but um, something outside of us that we project our own anxieties about ourselves and each other onto. Each other onto. And media are the ideal scapegoat for almost everything. The media do this, the media do that, whether positive or negative. And that doesn't mean those claims are cannot be true. Like I said in the beginning of my answer, sometimes they are. But it does mean that we should always take a step back as students and scholars when we talk about the effects of media to appreciate what we were just doing. What are we projecting onto media that perhaps we can also use as a mirror because it says something about who we are. And that's why I find it so important for us to always be aware of our own position or positionality, if you want to use the term, in our work, in our studies, and in our research. It matters who you are and what you think is good or bad or right and wrong in terms of what kind of studies you do, what kind of research you engage in, what kind of questions you ask of the world. And if you can make Make that explicit, you can make your normative assumptions explicit, and you'll have a better, much better grip on the good and bad that media do. And this is what we call actually life in media and communication studies research. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Prof. Finally, uh, once again, uh, I'm truly grateful. And in fact, you know, I feel very much privileged and honored, not only for me, but uh, for my school as well. Uh, that we finally, after one and a half year, could be able to organize this most awaited session and provided a platform to the scholars worldwide, you know, who joined us and they try to share uh, their interesting ideas and, you know, uh, their insights as well. Uh, when it comes to recording, uh, we will upload uh, this recording to our official YouTube channel, School of Media and Communication Studies, so scholars can uh, get it easily. Right. And once again, uh, thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Professor Mark and the participants worldwide who joined us this evening. Looking forward to have a more interesting uh, session in the future as well. Thank you so much and bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.